Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. I'm John Dickerson. Speaker John Boehner is with us. This interview had been planned for some time. We were originally going to talk about the Pope's visit, and we will. But first, there's that big announcement you made Friday. And so I want to talk to you about that, but let's get right to the news. Four days the government runs out of money. Is there going to be a shutdown? No. Uh, the Senate is expected to pass a continuing resolution next week. Uh, the House uh, will take up uh, the Senate bill. Uh, we'll also take up uh, uh, a select committee uh, to investigate uh, these horrific videos uh, that we've seen uh, from uh, abortion clinics uh, in several states uh, that really raise questions about uh, the use of federal funds and raise questions uh, about uh, uh, aborted fetuses that are born alive. Well, the continuing resolution, will that require Democratic votes to pass? Uh, I'm sure it will, uh, but I expect uh, my Democrat colleagues want to keep the government open as much as I do. And what about the rest of the business you want to get done before October 30th? What's on the to-do list? Well, we've got, uh, I've got another 30 days uh, to be Speaker, and uh, uh, I'm going to make the same decisions uh, the same way I have uh, over the last four and a half years uh, to make sure that, uh, that we're passing conservative legislation uh, that uh, it is good for the country. So I expect that uh, we might have a little more cooperation from uh, uh, some around town to try to uh, get as much finished as possible. I don't want to leave uh, my successor uh, a, uh, a dirty barn. So I want to clean the barn up a little bit before the next person gets there. Well, let me st let's talk about the state of the barn and its relative cleanliness. A lot of your colleagues I've talked to and friends out of who served with you use the word dysfunction and say basically that you had to resign because as it's a sign of how dysfunctional things are in the House with Republicans. What do you say? Well, I, I wouldn't call it dysfunction. Disagreement, yes. Uh, but uh, as I said on Friday, I was planning on leaving at the end of last year. And when my friend uh, Eric Kander uh, lost his uh, primary election in uh, July of uh, last year, it was clear to me that I just couldn't leave, uh, that uh, I had to provide a transition for uh, the next leaders. So I planned on uh, serving through this year. And on November 17th, I was going to make an announcement. And on uh, Thursday evening and Friday morning, I looked up and went, why do I want to put my colleagues through this when I'm going to make the same announcement six weeks from now? Why do I want to put the institution through this? And, uh, and so it's, uh, it was the right decision. Uh, it was, I, frankly, I thought we handled it uh, the right way. When you talk about the decision that they were going to have to go through, it was going to be a pretty messy... Yeah, a, a motion to vacate the chair. Yeah. So and kick you out of your job, just sorry, to help people at home who don't understand what vacating the chair right. is. Uh, listen, winning that, that vote was never an issue. I was going to get the overwhelming number of... Uh, I had gotten 400 votes probably. Uh, but uh, why do I want to make my members, Republican members, like walk the plank? Uh, because they're going to get criticized at home. Uh, by some who are, you know, who think that we ought to be more aggressive. Yeah. Listen, we've accomplished a, a lot over the four and a half years uh, that I was Speaker. And whether it was the largest deficit reduction deal in the history of the country, uh, saving $2.1 trillion, protecting 99% of the American people from an increase in our taxes, or the first major entitlement reforms uh, in 20 years. Uh, all done over the last four and a half years with a Democrat president and all voted against by my most conservative members because it wasn't good enough. Really? This is the part that I, I really don't understand. You know, our founders gave us the system of government, a majority in the House, you need 60 votes in the Senate. And, you know, if the House and the Senate can agree, the President gets to decide. And uh, our founders didn't want uh, some uh, parliamentary system where if you won the majority, you got to do whatever you wanted. They wanted this long, slow process. And so change comes slowly, and obviously too slowly for some. Well, are they unrealistic about what can be done in government? That's the dysfunction. Absolutely, they're unrealistic. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Bible says uh, beware of false prophets. And there are people out there, you know, spreading uh, uh, noise about how much can get done. I mean, this whole idea that we're going to shut down the government uh, to get rid of Obamacare in 2013... This plan never had a chance. Uh, but over the course of uh, the August recess in 2013 and the course of September, uh, you know, a lot of my Republican colleagues who knew it was a fool's errand, uh, really, they were getting all this pressure from home to do this. And so uh, we got groups here in town, members of the House and Senate here in town, who whip people into a frenzy, believing 
they can accomplish things that they know, they know are never going to happen. It's just, but listen, I've had 25 great years here in Washington. I've had great staff. I've had great colleagues and, and I'm very thankful to my uh, family and to my constituents uh, for giving me the honor to do this. Is uh, Ted Cruz a false prophet? Uh, listen, you can pick a lot of names out. But I'll let you choose them. You don't debate that assertion? Uh, I'll refer to you to my remark at a fundraiser I made in, uh, in August in Steve Bus Springs, Colorado. Let me put up a picture of you as a member of the Gang of Seven 25 years ago. Um, you are the last member of the Gang of Seven still serving. Do you, you were a rabble rouser then, you got some things changed in Republican leadership. Do you see any of yourself in these current conservatives who are giving you grief now? Uh, no, I was a rebel, and it wasn't about shaking up the Republican leadership, it was about shaking up the House. Uh, the House uh, was, uh, uh, was, was run as one Democrat chairman called it the last plantation in America. And uh, whether it was the House bank scandal, the restaurant scandal, the post office scandal, I sent a, my share of uh, members uh, uh, to jail over improper activities in the House. Uh, but out of that, uh, we began to question how the House itself was being run, the floor of the House. Uh, helped us uh, write the contract with America, helped us uh, get into the majority, and uh, it's, uh, it's been a great run. Let me ask you about the, uh, uh, you, by the way, you called Ted, uh, I believe the word you used was jackass, referring to uh, Senator I'm referring Cruz. to that same remark. All yeah. right, all right. We've uh, buttoned that up for the American people. Pope Francis uh, switching to a much more bigger topic here. What was a bigger accomplishment for you, becoming named speaker or having the Pope come as your guest? The kid who uh, grew up as an altar boy, having the Pope here was a big deal. And uh, I've tried over the last 20 years with the last three popes uh, to get them to come and address a joint session of Congress. I'll never forget the, uh, the first time I did this, uh, back in 1995 or six, uh, it somehow it showed up in the press and my mother called me. Still alive then, and uh, my mother never called me. And uh, so I answered the phone, John, it's your mother. Now listen, I see you're inviting the Pope. If he comes, I'm there. You got it? Yes, Ma, I got it. She was with you there this time. Well, looking from above. Yeah, that's what I mean. Tell me about that day, uh, or the impression it left on you. I mean, it's a big deal having him come, but then you're in his presence. Yes, yes. Uh, so we had a nice greeting when he came to the Capitol, and once the cameras were gone and the, uh, the Pope sat down, I said, uh, your, your Holy Father, I said, you're on Boehner time. He looked at me kind of funny, and I said, that means you're on time or you're early, and you're early. Uh, but we had a, uh, we had a wonderful, uh, wonderful chat, and uh, uh, Father, or Cardinal Whirl and myself uh, I got into a conversation with the Pope about uh, our commitment to kids and education. So, and then uh, the meeting broke up, and my family came in, and my uh, six-week-old uh, grandson, Alistair, I was blessed by the Pope. It was a very nice Pope. Um, when you, and then you, you, you told another story about the, what the Pope said to you about prayer. Yeah, we uh, had left the, the balcony where the, the Pope had addressed uh, all the people on the west front of the Capitol. And we came through uh, my office, and uh, the Pope went down to the first floor on my elevator, and I took the British steps down to the first floor. And uh, in, in what we now call Freedom Foyer, I was standing there with the Pope, and uh, the cardinals and the rest of his entourage were all moving out to, to their vehicles, and uh, the Pope takes his left uh, arm and grabs my left arm and pulls me near him and, and uh, saying really nice words. I would repeat them, except that would really cause me to cry. Uh, and, then, uh, and then he put his arm around me and, uh, and pulled me right into him and said, please pray for me. Well, you can imagine. Yeah. And I was uh, a mess. Yeah. Who yeah. am I to pray for the Pope? Yeah. But I did. You did. T um, there is a belief in the Catholic Church that the Holy Spirit can move <laughs> us. Did it, after that visit, to make this decision for you? Well, I thought, I think it helped uh, 
clear the picture. I, I never re related one of these instances with the other, but uh, clearly uh, uh, by Friday night it was pretty obvious to me that, uh, hey, I think it's time to do this. And so you woke up Friday morning and... Uh, Thursday night. Thursday Fr night. Woke up Friday morning, walked up to Starbucks and back, and walked uh, to Pete's and back, my regular jaunts in the morning. At 7.45 Friday morning, I said, yep, it's time to do this. Yeah. So in a year or so, you'll be back uh, in Statuary Hall for the unveiling of your portrait. <sighs> and uh, what do you want them to say about you at that ceremony? He was a good man. That's it. That's all. Yeah. And do you have anything that you can say now that you're headed out the door that... Uh, that you wouldn't have said if you had to uh, go through another election. No, I love my colleagues. Uh, I even love the ones I don't, you know, that may disagree with me, Republicans or Democrats. I love my colleagues. I love the institution, and uh, you know, I try to do the right thing every day. I'm a pretty simple guy. I just try to do the right things for the right reasons, and the right things will happen. Tell us about your thoughts about President Obama. You worked on that fiscal, that that grand bargain. It didn't come through. Reflect on that for a minute. Yeah, it's probably one of uh, the biggest disappointments uh, in my speakership. Uh, we were so close uh, to having, we had an agreement. Uh, and then two days later, the president uh, uh, walked away from it. Uh, it would have saved about $5 trillion over uh, 10 years. It would have been good for our economy, it had been good for the country, it had been good for our kids and our grandkids. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's Washington. Things happen and we move on. I had a nice conversation with President Obama on Friday morning, nice conversation with my, one of my dear friends, George W. Bush, and all my legislative colleagues, yeah. uh, the leaders. What advice do you leave for your, uh, for your successor about the job? Just do the right things for the right reasons. If you keep the country's best interest in, in, in mind and, uh, uh, and have the, the courage to, to do what you can do, and it's easy to have the courage to do what you can't do, but to have the courage to do what you can do, uh, just go do it. In our system of government, it's not about Hail Mary passes. It's, uh, it's the Woody Hayes uh, School of Football. Three yards and a cloud of dust. Three yards and a cloud of dust. It's a slow, methodical process. Uh, I want to ask you one last, uh, you're gonna, what are you going to do now, by the way? I don't know. I haven't had time to think about it. <laughs> I made this decision and... Uh, uh, we'll figure it out. One thing that uh, I heard a rumor about that you might be able to admit now that you're uh, leaving, uh, do you do yoga? I do. I do. I, I, I'm not, been not as diligent about lately as I used to uh, over the, a year ago, but uh, I do. As a matter of fact, I thought about it this morning because uh, it's, uh, it's great for my back. I've had back problems for 50 years. And, but, uh, you know, the older you get, all those tendons, muscles, they all want to tighten up. It's good to stretch them out. Yeah. It helps the golf game? It does. All right. Speaker John Boehner, thanks so much for being with nice us. Nice to be with you. We hope to see you again, by the way. You'll come back in retirement? Uh, we'll see. Yeah. There will be lots to talk about.